but the book as such was the missal that had been used for centuries by the Roman Curia. And he canonized it with the decree quo primum in which he says, not only the book must never be changed in the future, this mass must be said by all priests in the future, but the decree as such is irreformable. Some people now argue that the Pope cannot bind the Pope. They argue in what you call legalistic nonsense. They quote Roman law and they misquote Roman law because they quote Roman law well, but they quote Roman law on a wrong level by quoting the old line, par in parem potestatem non habet. An equal has no power over an equal. The Pope at first sight may seem another Pope's equal, but then how about the dogma of the Immaculate Conception? Can a future Pope take that back? No, you know very well he can't. So that means that the Popes have to respect their predecessors. And as a matter of fact, that's exactly what the old oath, oath of our incoronation says. Don't be mistaken by the fact that the oath of incoronation was signed in writing by the popes only between the year 781 and 1302. But the text of the oath of incoronation is still today to be found in that singular collection of rites that pertain only to the pope called Liber Diurnus Romanorum Pontificum. The text is still there. No pope has ever contradicted that text. We are talking about basically 1,500 years approved theology. That means it's the faith of the church that the pope cannot change things. And there, in the oath of incoronation, it says, if I was to betray the handed down tradition of my predecessors, God shall not be a merciful judge to me at the last judgment. So tradition binds the Pope, especially in liturgy. Why? The oldest liturgical principle that has been written down the first time in the year 250, exactly 1750 years ago, is Lex orandi statuat legem credendi. The law of what has to be prayed will determine the law of what has to be believed. Do not confuse the law of what has to be believed with the deposit of faith. The deposit of faith is at the very beginning of everything. But the law of what has to be prayed, that is the Roman Missal, for example, will determine the law of what has to be believed. What is the law of what has to be believed? The creed, for example, every time you recite the creed at Sunday Mass, at the same time you recite what you have to believe, what you have to believe in order to remain a Catholic. Now, in the liturgy, you always found the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. You talk about Lex Orandi, the law of what has to be prayed. In an ancient missal of the 14th century, or in a handwritten missal of the 8th century, you will find the Feast of the Immaculate Conception on December 8th. That's the law of what has to be prayed, because the priests had to celebrate that feast. However, it only became the law of what, had to be, what has to be believed in 1854, when Pope Pius IX proclaimed the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. So you can easily see in history that the law of what has to be prayed will determine the law of what has to be believed. Lex orandi statuat legem credendi. Until Pope Pius XI included, no pope ever misquoted that line. So for uninterrupted 1,600-something years, we had the popes quoting the same line in the same way, always saying the same thing. Then Pius XII in 1947 turned this line around, which I don't think he had the right to do. It's a theological mistake, but it's not our topic today to talk about Pius XII. <coughs> you can see from this principle that the Roman Missal cannot be considered a mere disciplinary law. It is much more than that. It is way above any discipline. 
The Roman Missal is the number one law of what has to be prayed because Holy Mass is the number one prayer. Therefore, when Pius V said, this Missal cannot be changed, and this decree confirming that is irreformable, he did, in fact, bind his successors. I ask you, is this my interpretation or is it the Pope's? Well, I showed you that is the papal interpretation because even John the 23rd did not dare to take out Quo Primum or the decree followed with, uh, by Clement VIII or the decree by Urban VIII. He did not dare to replace these documents. That means even John the 23rd visibly thought that he was bound by his predecessor's decrees. That makes 400 years of popes being bound, be, f who felt, quote, unquote, that they were bound. Of course, the popes didn't just have a feeling about it. Leave the feelings in California. <laughs> in the Vatican, you have theologians to discuss things like that. Every single pope, before he writes a decree, will ask his cardinals and his theologians on how to write it. Very few popes ever were proud enough to think that they could single-handed write decrees. And that shows you why the new right, which Paul VI himself called Novus Ordo Misse, the new order of mass, is not a work of the church. And it cannot be considered the Latin Roman rite because the Latin Roman rite is bound in the old Roman Missal. So what do you call it? Well, I call it a schismatical new rite. Why? Why? What does schism mean? <clears throat> Literally, in Greek, schisma means to cut, to cut, a cut somewhere. Schism, to go into schism means you cut yourself off the church. You do not split the church, as John Paul II says, or wants you to believe. You cut yourself off the church. You cut yourself off from the church. You leave the church, in short. A schismatic act is not necessarily a formal schismatic act by declaration so that you're really to be considered a schismatic, but it is something that cuts off something of the church. Now, against church tradition and against the Council of Trent, against Quo Primo, and against the interpretation of 400 years of papacy, Paul VI wrote up a new rite. Therefore, that has to be considered a schismatic rite. If it is a schismatic rite, it cannot be considered the Roman rite. If it's not the Latin Roman rite, but a schismatic rite, you cannot apply Pope Pius XII decree Sacramentum Ordinis to examine its validity. You will have to examine the validity of the Novus Ordo rite the same way the Church has always examined the validity of schismatic rites. How did the Church go about it? Now the last one to go into a thorough examination of schismatic rites was Pope Leo XIII in, seven, in 1894 in his decree Apostolice Cure, in which he decides that Anglican orders are not valid. How did he go about it? Now, first of all, he studied the history of the Anglican rites, as we all willingly or not, have studied the history of the Novus Ordo, as we are witnesses to its, most of us are witnesses to its publication, most of us are witness to the disaster it, uh, it caused, and most of us are witnesses to the heresies and the apostasies that are a result of the Novus Ordo Misse. The second thing to examine was the matter. That hasn't changed in the Novus Ordo, it's no problem. The third, the, uh, the, the third thing to examine was <coughs> the form of the sacrament. That has changed. It has changed especially in Mass and at ordination. <coughs> Before uh, we examine the validity of ordinations, I will shortly tell you what I think about the validity of the new Mass it's not our topic really today, but uh, as long as bread and wine is used, we have no reason to discuss the matter. 
How about the form? Now, in Latin, the essence of the words are still kept, not in the translations. In Latin, it says hocus denim corpus meum in the old rite and hocus denim corpus meum quip quod provobis tradetur in the new rite. For the chalice, the only thing that changed was that the Mysterium Fide is kept out, which is not essential to the transubstantiation. Moral theology has never held that in the days before the Council. The problem is the translations. In the Latin original, it says, Hic est denim calic sanguinis mei novet eterni testamenti Mysterium Fide qui provobis et promultis et promultis effonetur in remissionem peccatorum. Christ gave his blood for the many, not for all. In the English translation, it reads for all. In the German translations, tr translation, the same, für alle. In the Italian translation, per tutti. In the Spanish translation, per todos. In all the translations, except the Polish translation of all, the translation changed from for the many to for all. How do you judge such a change? There's two ways. First of all, you look up old moral theologies. In the old moral theologies, you will find that many moral theologians say it is enough for the validity of mass to say, this is my body, and then to say, this is my blood. That is something to be looked at very carefully. What was the problem they discussed? When you find a moral theologian given an answer to a problem, you also have to ask yourself what was the problem he discussed in the first place. Now the problem was accident. What happens if an old priest is saying mass? While he says mass, he gets kind of sick, but he continues with mass. At the consecration, he pronounces the words of consecration over the bread. Then he takes up the child, picks up the chalice, and he starts to pronounce the words of consecration over the chalice. And all he manages to say is, he is denim calic sanguinis may, and that moment he drops dead. Now that is a problem. What is it now? Wine or the blood of Christ? What is it? So moral theologians had to examine that problem. And within that context, they said, with the utmost probability, it is the blood of Christ. And that's why you read in the old moral the theologies that it is the blood of Christ. However, the point is, we are talking about a problem within the frame of the traditional liturgy. We are not talking about a problem outside it. What if you talk about something outside the traditional liturgy? What if you talk about something outside Mass? Now, <clears throat> as you will see when we discuss the intention of the sacrament, the intention of a sacrament always has to be to do what the Church does, not to do what the Church wants, or to do what the Church did, or to do what the Church will do in the future, but to do what the Church does. What is it what the Church does? Well, what the Church has always done is what the Church does. What the Church has always outlawed is what the Church does not. In the Code of Canon Law, be it the new Code of Canon Law or the old Code of Canon Law or all the books before, it says to attempt to consecrate outside Mass is nefas, sacrilege. Nefas is a very strong Latin word derived from fas, F-A-S. Fas is divine law. Nefas, therefore, is not divine law, the contrary of divine law, therefore something extremely evil. So the canon in the old or the new code of canon law should be translated to attempt to consecrate outside mass is extremely evil. It is not the purpose of a law book to define if that is possible. It's only the purpose of a law book to say if it's allowed or not. Now, if the church for 2,000 years has called the attempt to consecrate outside mass a sacrilege, then you cannot, say, you cannot say the church does it. That means if I was to play a terrible joke on our Lord 
And if I attempted to consecrate the wine contained in this carafe, nothing 